you. You've heard some very interesting technologies so far. So let's go a little bit farther and just see what's there and discuss what we can believe or not. So let's say that you are an investor and somebody comes to you with a rotating machine. And this rotating machine uh, just keeps on turning and it's got a little fan blade in front of it so it's blowing air. It's obviously putting power out. There's no evident power going in and it just keeps on going and going. Uh, this happened to me, by the way, uh, where I, I, I did see this. So the question then is, you've seen the demonstration, should you invest? Or if not, what else do you need to do? What else do you need to know? And that's the question I have in approaching a lot of these technologies. So I'm going to, in this presentation, talk about a few examples of some of these technologies, uh, talk about where the mainstream, uh, mainstream science and technology might be going wrong in assessing these, and uh, then the, the third part of this is where the inventors may themselves be going wrong instead. There are many of these. If you take a look on the internet, take a look at YouTube, there are lots and lots of these technologies. I don't have time to go into all of them. I'm just going to pick a few spot examples to talk about very quickly and then go ahead and talk about the other aspects. Uh, one thing I will try to do in this presentation is to avoid giving my opinion on these technologies. Instead, I just want to put them out there for now. So uh, you've heard uh, from uh, Professor Violante about low energy nuclear reaction. Uh, since Pons and Fleischmann uh, in 1989, who uh, developed what at the time was called cold fusion, uh, it seems to have existed, but uh, people aren't sure. Sometimes you get it to work, sometimes you don't. Uh, probably one of the, the, the or the most uh, uh, long-term investigator of, of this, who's, who's gone into great depth, is Mike Recubre sitting in the room. Uh, um, and Professor Violante is, is, is one of the current leaders who's shown us uh, some real understanding. But do we believe it? Uh, if you look at uh, somebody like the Rossi ECAT, uh, many of you have heard about this. This is a, supposed to be a uh, large uh, cold fusion reactor built in Italy. Uh, he's had a lot of in investors interested. He's had various sorts of tests that have been carried out uh, since 2011. Is it real? We still haven't had a truly independent test of this. You can ask the question. Uh, there's another company, uh, Defcalion, in Greece that for a while uh, was considered the, the, the great hope. Uh, they uh, presented uh, to the world uh, the, the apparently excess energy. Uh, recently, there was uh, an analysis of this by Gambarelli, which essentially demolished that and showed that, in fact, what they exposed as being, what they uh, wanted to show as being excess energy was probably due to a, uh, a mismeasurement where uh, they measured the temperature uh, of uh, a flow through a certain area, and this temperature showed excess heat but the flow was completely wrong. And so they actually got much less excess heat than they had. So uh, here, I guess I will express an opinion. I, it, it, low energy nuclear reaction is real. Uh, there's, there's, at this point, I believe there's no question about it. What it is, uh, there, there are st still questions about. Uh, I have had uh, two PhD students working on low energy nuclear reaction, among other technologies. And, one of them was Olga Dmitrieva, who you've heard from at the SSE. She made a presentation in 2012. And in her work, she looked at one type of low energy nuclear reaction, which is a gas phase no, uh, uh, process. The reason she chose that is that it seemed to give excess heat very repeatedly, whereas this liquid phase stuff, electrolysis, is uh, less predictable. And so she did some. Uh, deep work on this and demonstrated very clearly that it was not due to uh, any sort of nuclear fusion, but in fact was a chemical reaction. Uh, that when you've got deuterium 
in the presence of water contamination, which is nearly always there, the deuterium replaces the hydrogen in the water. That's an exothermic reaction, and you get excess heat. And if you're not careful, you can mistake it for being a fusion. And she showed this both putting the hydrogen in, taking the hydrogen out, and deuterium, and so on. Uh, another type of reaction that she looked at was uh, a, a gas phase measurement in a uniform temperature chamber, which is a, a sort of calorimeter that uh, people uh, use for, for these uh, measurements. And, and the uh, instrument that she looked at is a very high quality system, which is supposed to maintain the temperature within a small fraction of a degree. But what she found was that slight variations in the temperature inside that chamber could lead to extremely misleading uh, amounts of excess heat that you believe were produced in the system. So you would think you're getting excess heat when in fact it was just due to some temperature uh, um, asymmetries, temperature gradients in the system. And she showed this experimentally, theoretically, and through simulations. So what's the point here? The point is that you've got to be very, very careful. You've got to do the sort of careful work uh, that uh, Dr. Violante has been doing. Uh, we heard about the PAP engine. So the PAP engine apparently was demonstrated. Uh, there, there's lots of evidence it was demonstrated. It was also mocked. W what do you believe? Uh, there's another type of uh, uh, exotic energy technology called cavitation. Uh, in cavitation, bubbles are formed in a liquid, and these bubbles collapse. And when they collapse, they collapse very violently. And in fact, uh, the collapse can be supersonic, and it can eject material uh, so intensely that that material might produce fusion. Uh, Teleyarkhan uh, showed this at Purdue in 2004. And he was later accused of fraud. And uh, his career essentially was demolished. What's the truth there? Uh, more recently, Mark LeClaire has demonstrated cavitation. And he's shown a whole array of nuclear products that come out of this cavitation reaction, including, unfortunately, um, radiation poisoning of himself and his lab partner. Uh, is this real? Uh, what can you do with it? Uh, Blacklight Power has been around for a number of years. I've sort of followed their website for, for more than a decade. And periodically, they say that they're going, they've got a product. It's about to come out. It's going to be sold. Uh, and it produces excess energy. How does this work? Uh, the the uh, leader, the president, Dr. Mills, has a theory of a hydrino which is a sub-ground state hydrogen atom that is used in this uh, uh, nickel hydride type of system to produce excess energy. Uh, they've raised more than $60 million over uh, this period of time. Is it real? Uh, another one that I, I find fascinating is T. Henry, Henry Moray. In the early 20th century, he repeatedly demonstrated that he could capture atmospheric radiation. And he had this system where he had a big row of light bulbs that were illuminated by the energy that was captured. Um, it's a lot like, by the way, t uh, test some Tesla systems for uh, gathering atmospheric radiation. Is this real? Can we use it? Uh, we've got to be careful. There are overstatements in the field. Uh, there are these two characters, Haish and Model, and they uh, purportedly invented a, 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 a scheme for uh, harvesting zero-point energy. Actually, Bernie Haish is here. And he, he came up with this idea and, and worked with me on, on, on uh, demonstrating it. And we've done a number of experiments. They were reported here uh, at the SSE several times. Uh, I presented this at a different meeting about a year and a half ago. And uh, I was very careful at the beginning of the presentation, at the end of the presentation, to say that the results are ambiguous. They're not proven. We do get excess heat. We don't know that it's due to a zero-point energy source. And further work is required to draw firm conclusions. I even wrote this on a slide. Then a little bit later, a report came out 
uh, from that meeting. And the report stated, and it's down here in the green, uh, their unusual theory of constricting a gas atom quantum mechanically and then looking for a release of energy actually worked, showing that zero point energy can be utilized to produce energy. Uh, you've got to be careful what you believe. You really have got to be careful. So what can we believe? Uh, there are a number of reasons that the mainstream goes wrong. Uh, one of these has to do with information cascades. Uh, the idea here is that an expert gives an erroneous opinion and it remains despite all sorts of contradictory evidence. And there are many examples. The poster child for this is a guy called Ansel Keys, who was a nutritionalist in the 1950s. And based on an incomplete study, he said that fat is bad for you and we should be eating carbohydrates and protein, but not fat. And this set off uh, 60 years of false and uh, inappropriate uh, uh, dietary uh, recommendations in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Many people suffered. Many people died because uh, of this incorrect uh, uh, um, information. And in fact, there was evidence that he was wrong right away in the 50s. But he was the expert. He said it, and it stuck. And it stuck. And only recently are we finally learning that eating good fats is actually very good for you. There are other ones. There, there are lots and lots of them. Water fluoridation, uh, sun exposure. Uh, and the question is, uh, does this also apply to uh, new sort of energy sources? Is there a, a, a cascade that's going in the wrong direction? Uh, there's also the issue of consensus, scientific consensus says that these new energy technologies are bunk. That, that uh, 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 Violanti, Sheehan, uh, Papp, all of these guys are clear quacks. Is that true? Uh, so we know from uh, Kuhn, from the structure of scientific revolutions, that science goes through various paradigms where uh, evidence keeps building up that something is wrong. People say, no, 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 the, the, what we believe is right, it's right, it's right, until finally there's a revolution and things change. And so we have seen many examples of consensus science. There, there are very many of them. So there was the consensus which was against Galileo and heliocentric uh, solar system. There was the consensus for many years that was against uh, a Wegener and a continental drift. Uh, there's a consensus right now about anthropogenic uh, causes for climate change. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but that's, it's sort of consensus science. And there are many more. Um, what should we say about consensus? Michael Crichton was very clear about it. And this is just one of a number of statements he said. Consensus is invo invoked only in situations where the science is not solid enough. Just because everybody says so doesn't make it so. So that's one side. Now let's take a look at the other side. Where can inventors go wrong? Where do some of these inventors go wrong? I've been exposed to this because uh, I'm an academic position and people know I work on new energy technologies. And so I get emails and calls and things to referee. And I've seen now many times the this, 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 this sort of flaws that I'm going to present to you. Um, and th they're based on I believe this, this, this uh, Dumming-Kruger effect. Uh, and the, the, the idea here, it's a, this is a psychological effect uh, in which there are two types of cognitive bias. One is where unskilled people don't recognize they're stupid. And so they rate their ability much higher than is accurate. And stupid is a relative sense here. I mean, in other words, they're uninformed in, in, in one particular field. On the other hand, highly skilled people think everybody knows what they know, and they underrate uh, what they're saying. And th so you see this sort of a curve here, where if you look at experience, the very inexperienced people are the ones who, who are making the, the, the grand statements. I have to say, I've been in that position myself. When I start off in a new field, I often think I understand everything until I realize I don't. So are new energy inventors in this category? One thing that I've seen over and over and over, I, I saw it just two weeks ago. Again, I was looking up the PAP engine. There was, there's a YouTube video um, showing somebody measuring the output of, the, of their PAP engine. 
They measure the voltage, and they, they see this. They measure the current, they see that. They multiply the two together, say that's the power, and say, oops, we got, we got more power out than we put in. So let's take a look at that. If you look at a, a sinusoidally varying voltage uh, in the blue here, and a sinusoidally varying current in the red, voltage times current is power, and so the green shows you the power. And the power, in this case, is positive. It, it goes through two cycles. Um, if we then take a look at uh, a voltage and current that are out of phase with each other, and you multiply them together, you get a sinusoidal oscillating power that goes positive and negative. This is called reactive power. It does not give you any real power. You cannot measure, measure voltage and power separately. You've got to measure them together. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, Daniel Sheehan certainly explained that to us. One, in, one way of stating it is that it's impossible to convert heat from a system at uniform temperature into work. So I was emailed this invention. Uh, it's uh, essentially, uh, what I'm going to show you, a triangular chamber with some gas in it. The gas is going to bounce dominantly towards the fat end of the chamber because every time it hits this wall, it'll bounce to the left, and that's what you see here. You could make a version of this which is circular, and so the, the gas is going to go sort of around and around in the circle. And the idea was you can invent, you can have gas just continuously flowing. You can make a motor that goes forever and ever. Does it work? Well, there's a problem here. And that is, and this is classical second law stuff. Uh, there's going to be a buildup of gas on one side, so there will be this bouncing of the gas preferentially in one direction. But there's also going to be a diffusion gradient in the other direction. And ga gas will diffuse in the, the other way, and you end up with no net motion. Um, so does the second law always apply? Daniel Sheehan beautifully described an example where it doesn't. Uh, it does apply, I believe, mostly near equilibrium and in closed systems, maybe not always. Where does it not apply? Well, it certainly doesn't apply far from equilibrium in fast-changing systems and open systems and in other cases. Then we've got the case of conservation of energy, that the total energy of a closed system does not change. Well, I was uh, reviewing a, a, a little article uh, a while ago in which somebody said he had a very simple demonstration for how conservation of energy can be broken. And it can be broken simply by accelerating an object with a constant force. So according to this paper, what you do is uh, you just give a constant push to an object. And I, I won't go through the, the arithmetic right here, but you can very easily show that the kinetic energy, the energy of motion of this particle, increases with time squared when you're applying a, a, a constant velocity. It, it, it goes as velocity, energy is the velocity squared, and uh, the, the, the energy, the kinetic energy goes as time squared. Uh, so therefore, and this was, was in, in that paper, uh, if you have energy versus time, there's a cumulative increase in the input energy that goes linearly with time, because you're just applying a constant force. And the kinetic energy of the particle eventually uh, is, is parabolic and increases uh, faster. And so eventually, it exceeds the input energy. And there is a simple demonstration of how conservation of energy can be broken. However, if you look a little more closely at it, you can say, no, new energy is not created. Because if you're uh, applying a constant force to an accelerating object, that means that you've got to be pushing harder. You've got to put more and more energy into it as the object gets faster and faster. So in fact, the uh, cum cumulative energy that you put in increases at the same rate as the kinetic energy of the, of the, of the system. So we, we, we know these things, and yet uh, we make these errors. So what can we believe? Uh, maybe at a future SSE talk, uh, I will present you uh, the answer to that. Um, so in the meantime, what I'd like to do is set up a lab at the University of Colorado to look at these things. And the idea is to investigate a small group of select energy technologies. And this would be uh, run a lot like uh, what uh, my, uh, en my PhD students who've worked on new energy technologies have done so far. And that is, 
They're advocates for the energy. We're not a debunking lab. We're not trying to disprove something. What we're trying to do is understand it. And we dig, and we dig, and we dig, and we look into it very deeply and try to nurture the technologies and understand them. If we find it works, great. If we find it doesn't work, so be it, and we'll decide it doesn't work, and we publish the, the negative results as well. This requires skilled students. Uh, it, it, this is it, one really needs to do. Again, I, I'm sorry to keep referring to you, but the sort of quality work that uh, Dr. Violante has done, where you just dig and dig and, until you finally get to it. Um, and it's clearly going to need some major donations, which I do not have yet. Uh, the results will be that we will know what to believe. And so I can try to answer these questions to you a little better. And that we can develop some prom promising candidate technologies and actually uh, produce the excess energy that, that the world so much needs. Thank you. Your point, your point about where inventors go wrong, Bernie Carlson, in talking about Tesla, when he was in Colorado, was that he was too interested in finding confirmations, didn't spend enough time looking for disconfirmations. Mm. That fits a sort of cognitive dissonance thing. Yes. So that if you're really excited about this, you want to see something consistent with your expectations. So that if you're going to really do the work, then you have, as you say, you, know, you have to keep going and you have to check for the disconfirmations. Yeah, nice talk. Um, I, I applaud your notion of setting up a dispassionate scientific laboratory to look into these uh, emerging technologies. I mean, there is no coordinated way of doing that right now. And I mean, some of these things are clearly true. I mean, I mean Joe Pop's engine ran. It's ridiculous, it's impossible, but it, 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 it did run and therefore needs to be investigated further. And when ARPA-E was first mooted and they put out their first call for, for solicitations, I submitted a proposal to do basically that, you know, set up a laboratory, a, a central clearinghouse for alternative energy uh, projects. At SRI? At SRI. And, um, seemed to me a very rational thing to do, have a hub, you know, have some centralized uh, instrumentation, uh, have uh, establish a discipline. A lot of these uh, inventors work by themselves. Working by yourself is an easy way to fall into the error of systematic uh, effects that you right. don't fully understand. So you need adult supervision. Yes. And. Um, seemed to me like a great idea. So I submitted the uh, proposal to ARPA-E, their first round of solicitation. It came back unreviewed. Right, right. So um, although it seems like a good idea to you and it seems like a good idea to me, it doesn't seem like a good idea to our masters. This is not going to be funded by the government. This right. is going to be funded by uh, private philanthropists who really believe it's got to be done. Yes. Uh, Garrett, um, you mentioned T. Henry Moray's work back in the 1920s and 30s, which a lot of people know about. Um, ha have you investigated that to any degree to find out um, if anyone is doing anything on that? I understand his son was in, you know, had preserved his papers and research at least, but I don't know what has transpired since then or if, or if the son is doing any research or if maybe somebody is working for him. You knew elucidate us on, on the status of that at any degree? So I, you know, I, this, this lab has not been established. I haven't really dug into things more deeply than one simply can by internet searches and so on. And yes, his son is promoting the technology. He, as far as I understand, he has not done any experiments. Uh, and w w we're sort of waiting. We're waiting for somebody who's to demonstrate it. This is not a hard one to demonstrate. It really is not a hard one to demonstrate. Further questions for Dr. Medell?
Thanks a lot for the great work. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this very much uh, here in the Bay Area uh, myself as a proponent. Uh, I'm, I'm really also concerned with a sort of overarching uh, sort of the, the great gods, the overlord, the seers of corporate reality that sort of like, mm -hmm. like raise their eyebrows and want to sort of have their drones listening in, if possible, during these <laughs> you know, formative moments of these interest areas that you like you're discussing. Um, the, the role of the academic world is kind of interesting in relation to that. Very this interesting. Is, this is not just a funding thing. It turns out to be a tap. A funding tap is kind of like a, you go on water, cold water, hot water, or no water, you know, kind of thing. That's right. How about an applied drought, you know, kind of thing. So, but I'm also interested in, in the other thing aside from that, which is like the, the yes or thumbs up or thumbs down kind of thing. Now, that's not a blanket reality as far as the corporate world because there's all kinds of like small competing corporations that feel angry at the big guys that won't let them play the game competitively, et cetera, et cetera. So, so how do you kind of approach this whole thing about like the overarching cloud of the negative orgone of the, <laughs> of the corporate reality in relation to the, getting this past just the idea stage? Uh, that's a very good point, and th the only way I know to answer is to say I just don't care. Uh, so I went, I, I helped organize and went to a conference about nine months ago on new energy. It was called the Breakthrough Energy Movement uh, uh, Conference. And it, it was a big conference, bigger than this actually. And people, there was one point in the conference where people actually applauded me for being there because I was the only academic who would show his face at this thing. And so th what you're saying is, is absolutely right. Uh, you know, academics, you just, you, you don't go there. You don't go there. Uh, and at this point, I'd say, I don't care. I don't care what people think. I want to find what's, what's real here. And uh, it, it's, it's an uphill battle. And thank you for your contributions, Garrett. Thank you.